Scripture reading this morning will be from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 24 through 32. And put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must no longer steal, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands that uh, what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear it. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. I missed you. I wasn't here last Sunday, but I understood you had a great uh, day of worship together, and it's great to be back with you today. I want to start by telling you about a little something that happened when I was in the airport, and uh, one of the reasons that I'm actually really grateful for masks, that this is just kind of such, a, such an intriguing twist that I encountered. So I'm standing at the gate, waiting to board my flight to come uh, from Dallas to here. I got rerouted this weekend because of uh, flight cancellations. And so I'm just standing there, minding my own business, and uh, this guy walks up. And I'm, I'm, I've never, I've seen a lot of doppelgangers. You know what that is, right? Your doppelganger, somebody who looks like you, um, and you see them, and you're just like, oh, hey, that's, oh, wait a second, that's not. I, I thought for sure that this gentleman that I just saw was my former boss. My former boss, his name in a previous uh, profession, his name was Ron. His eyes, his hair color, his body shape, everything looked just like, but he had a mask on, so I could only see this much of his face, right? And so I said, Ron. And he looked at me and he said, hey, man. (laughs) And then he reaches out and grabs me. How are you? How is your family? In about six seconds, I realized this is not Ron. (laughs) But he goes with it. And I go with it. And I said, Ron, we're doing great. How about you? How about your family? Oh, everything is wonderful. I said, are you traveling to Phoenix? He says, oh, no, no, I'm going on to Charlotte. I was like, oh, man, it is so good to see you. You too. Pat you on the back. Hey, maybe our paths will cross again sometime. (laughs) There's a guy with him, and I know, I know this was the next conversation that they have. Hey, who was that? I have no idea. We, I, I got to tell you, life is fun, right? It is fun if we just engage with people. But that's not all. I sit down on the plane. You got to think about the mathematical probability of people who sit beside us, right? I mean, think about the number of people that get on a plane. They're all completely fooled these days. This lady sits down, and I find out it's Jaden's boss that actually is sitting down with me on the plane. So we have a conversation. We're just getting to know each other. A guy walks up and looks at her and says, you're in my seat. So she has to get up and move. We're just making connections all over the place, okay? And uh, so God is good. Hey, um, I want to draw your attention to this next slide up here and let you know that this was uh, as of yesterday. I know that's really hard to see because that's small print. But about 75% of the people who have taken the survey so far are over the age of 40. All right? So I need our... our, uh, our uh, younger Xers and our millennials and our uh, digitals or whatever the next generation, the Zs uh, are coming up. Get busy, okay, this week. Get busy this week. You got plenty of time to take it. I want to let you know we are listening to every single voice 
uh, and we are putting everything together thematically. Had a great conversation with the elders over the weekend, a great conversation with the search team over the weekend, and, and really looking forward to seeing this information uh, be shared with you um, probably within the next two to three weeks once we get the data and crunch everything. We'll be able to push that out. So that's a really, really exciting time. Also, I'm going to be here next weekend. The search team is not meeting together. We may be meeting for some one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I've got some time next Saturday. If any of you would like to meet for a coffee or if you'd like to meet for breakfast or for a lunch, that would be great. Uh, I'm staying with uh, Mike and Tina, so I'm not going to invite you to their house. I'll meet you like at a, you know, like at a Panera or something, uh, but would love to connect, uh, connect next Saturday if you would like to spend some one-on-one -on -one time. If all of you respond at the same time, that's going to be a little awkward um, with about 200 of us showing up at Panera at the same time, but uh, we'll call ahead if that's the case, okay? So there you go. All right, so we're in week four of an eight-week series on the book of Nehemiah. And so the first three lessons that we shared uh, as we looked at Nehemiah, we really focused on getting to know the heart uh, of the man Nehemiah by studying the book of Nehemiah. And so if you missed those first three sermons in this lesson, you can go to mesachurch.org and you can uh, listen to those lessons, which will give you some backdrop uh, for where we are today and where we're going for the next few Sundays. And so I want to start today with a question. We've been real text heavy over the past uh, three sermons. We're going to be really text heavy today. So if you've got your Bible, please, please get it out. Uh, if you've got a pen, jot down some of these scripture references. I would love to ask you to go back and explore these more as your week unfolds. Uh, but I want to start today with a question, and this is the question, what do I do when the walls of my life collapse? What do I do when the walls of my life collapse? And we're going to talk about a little practical application this Sunday and next Sunday as we entertain this uh, question. So we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 3, and we're going to look at several other passages as well, uh, some in the Old Testament, some in the New to reinforce what we learn from the text today. So let's go ahead and dive in. Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priest went to work. And remember, the walls of Jerusalem are in ruins. So that's what they're working on, restoring the walls of Jerusalem. So they went to work, and they rebuilt the sheep gate. They consecrated it. Some of your Bibles may say uh, dedicated instead of consecrated. Hang on to that. We'll come back to that thought here in just a bit. So they consecrated it and they set its doors in place and they built as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they consecrated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was built by the sons of um, Hasanaah. And I got to think, surely they were singing Hasanaah, Hasanaah. You know, <laughs> they had to do that at some point. I don't know. But they laid its beams in place and they put the doors and bolts and bars in place. And Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. And next to him... Uh, Meshulam, son of Berechiah, son of uh, Meshezabel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Baana, also made repairs. And the next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisor. Now, you're got, not going to be given a test on these names, okay? And the reason that I'm stopping reading right there is because if we continued reading in chapter 5, we would come across more names uh, and more uh, you know, lineage as we examine who's related to whom and who's working on what. And so these first five verses basically serve as a template for the rest of the chapter. But the way that the chapter starts is really important because there's about three reasons, but, but particularly as we think about the first reason why, Eliashib is the high priest. And there's three reasons why it's important to know that. One, if the high priest buys in, what's most likely going to happen? Everybody else is going to buy in, right? And so we see that occurring here. The other high priest rise up with him, or the other priest, rather, rise up with the high priest, and they join in the work. But even more importantly, they 
things who begin the work, they consecrate the work to the Lord. Uh, the word consecrate means to make or declare sacred, to set apart, uh, or to dedicate to the service of God. How often do we use the word consecrate these days? It's not a word that we mention a whole lot, right? Um, and maybe it's because we don't consider a lot of stuff sacred anymore. Uh, but under the former covenant, consecration was a very critical piece of, the, um, of their faith practice, of their faith walk. Constantly reminded Israel of who they were and whose they were. Parents, any of you ever say that to your kids when they go out the door? Remember who you are and remember whose you are. Well, that was the purpose of consecration under the former covenant. Now, it's kind of fascinating when you think about everything that could be consecrated under the former covenant. Um, animals could be set apart or consecrated to God. Notice in Exodus chapter 29 and verse 27, consecrate those parts of the ordination ram that belong to Aaron and his sons. Times could be consecrated or set apart. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 10, consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property um, and to your own clan. So animals could be set apart. Times could be set apart. Objects and people could be consecrated or set apart. Exodus chapter 29, verse 44. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Now, we don't see the word consecrate used as much in the New Testament. However, sacredness, holiness, these are synonyms for the word consecrated. And these are very, very much part of our journey as Disciples, I want you to notice what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's, you see the word there? Holy people. God's consecrated people. God's set apart people. Paul was not the only one to address this in the New Testament. We read the following in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. But just as he who called you is, say it with me, holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Our, our modern word holiday, you all know this right, comes from what phrase? What is holiday? What's it derived from? Holy day. Yeah, holiday is derived from the phrase holy day. And what does that mean? It means a day that's set apart. <laughs> it's, it's different. It's unique because of who or what it represents. Can I get an amen from our moms about Mother's Day, right, when everybody else gets to do all the, all the stuff? God, God does the same thing with his people. God sets us apart for a unique purpose, for a unique reason. I want you to notice some insight here that Peter brings to this, this setting apart. I think this is just some of the most beautiful language and, and, and one of the most incredible charges in all of the New Testament. In 2 Peter uh, 1, I just want to start reading in verse 5. Um, 3, rather, and we'll, we'll go on through 5 and beyond. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And then moving to verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness 
and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Because if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, in other words, if you grow more and more and more in these qualities, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice what he says next. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been, say that word with me, cleansed. That's set apart. That's consecrated. That's holy. Set apart, cleansed from their past sins. So, so practicing the spiritual disciplines, embracing the qualities and the characteristics that Peter describes, practicing these spiritual disciplines, that's what keeps our eyes open to see where God is at work. That's what keeps our ears open to hear the voice of God in everything that we do. But practicing spiritual disciplines is not what makes us holy. Only the blood of Christ can cleanse us from our sins. If we're not careful, a spiritual discipline can actually become an idol. And I think that's why Paul warns us in Ephesians chapter 2, for it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. So being consecrated or being set apart, being made holy, that's about what God does through the resurrected Christ. And when I believe this with all of my heart, that compels me to action as a believer. And I think even under the old covenant, those who were around Nehemiah, I think they understood this. They weren't setting the gates and the walls, they weren't setting those apart to highlight their goodness. They were setting the gates and the walls apart to honor God's goodness, to acknowledge His goodness. And I think when we understand this, I, I personally believe it's a, it's a game changer. Not just in relationship to how I see and how I interact with God, but also in my relationships with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And even in my relationships with those who do not yet know Christ. We see it play out in the Nehemiah text as we become aware of the third reason why listing Eliashib first, the high priest first, is important. The Hebrew text literally says that the high priest rose up with his fellow priests and rebuilt the sheep gate. So you see, instead of the high, the high priest and the other priest focusing on what is lost, they capture a vision of what can be. And they move from a state of, of just kind of drifting along, just kind of existing. They move from a state of, in large part, inaction to action. And why is this important? Why is it important for us to understand this? Because the walls of Jerusalem aren't the only things that lie in ruins. The resolve of the hearts of the most faithful among them, the resolve of their hearts was also in ruins. You see, the temple had been restored. We talked about that a few weeks ago. They were able to worship for the most part unhindered. However, they're still filled with shame because their forefathers had forgotten God. Nehemiah brings this to their attention. So put another way, that which was once sacred to their forefathers had been cast aside by leaders who wanted one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the kingdom of the world to the degree that, guess what, full circle, nothing was sacred anymore. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. If you remember this passage from 2 Kings 21, beginning at verse 10, the Lord said through his servants, the prophets, Manasseh, King of Judah has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him, and he's led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. Wow. 
That's some of the strongest language in the Old Testament. Earlier I mentioned we don't use the phrase or the word consecrate uh, very often these days, and maybe it's because uh, we consider so little sacred. But here's the deal. If nothing is sacred, then what's the only thing that's left? If nothing is sacred, if nothing is holy, if nothing is set apart for God, then what are we left with? Pretty much just our biology, right? Isn't that about the only thing that's left? Um, And if we're left exclusively with our biology, doing that which satisfies my flesh and makes me feel good and kind of get to live my own life and do what I want to do and kind of be my own, my own person, if I want to distance myself from God and just kind of focus on me, here's what I've seen time and time and time again in my own experience and in the lived experience of those who reject God. I think that's when the, the walls of our lives really begin to crumble, when we just start focusing on taking care of our biology I have some really good news for you, though. And it's the reason that the story of God is actually called good news. And that is no matter what you've done, it makes no difference. If you're breathing, you still have hope in Jesus. Your past does not have to be your present, and it doesn't have to be your future. And that's how powerful God's love is. God's love is so powerful that it can restore that which is broken. I think, again, that's why it's called good news. So as we move into Nehemiah 3, if we we were to take time this morning to read the entire chapter, there's a a few themes that that we would see really begin to pop and really begin to surface. And one of those themes is the, the theme of repairing or restoring. Just read a few verses and you'll see how evident those two themes are. The Hebrew word for repair, and this just amazes me, it occurs 34 times in the Hebrew text just in chapter 3 alone. So I think it's a theme that Nehemiah wants his readers to understand. He wants them to reflect on and to celebrate what God is doing among and through them. And you know what? God wants the exact same thing for us. I mean, too often we hear about what we're doing wrong. Might it sometimes be in our best interest to focus more on what God is doing right? I think that's what Nehemiah is trying to show them here. And here's the deal, this repairing and restoring, yes, surely it impacts them at the individual level, but there's something much more profound in play here. It also impacts their relationships, not only their relationship with God, but their relationships with one another. There is this intriguing phrase, we see it over and over and over in chapter 3, and it is the phrase, next to them. Next to them. You see, they're all in this together. This group's working here, but next to them is a group that's working on the other section. This group's working there, and next to them, there is this group that's working on another gate or on another section of the wall. I think it's just this powerful, powerful phrase, because even in our context, let's move from former covenant to new covenant. Jesus Christ calls us to be in this together next to you. That's the nature of the church. But there is this great irony that's in play right now, and that is that we in the United States aren't too keen on getting along with one another. Have you noticed? Have you noticed? We're not too keen on getting along. Now, we see this at the macro level. It's easy just to look at the headlines and kind of see what's going on. Sometimes it can creep into micro level, the way that we treat one another at home. I heard this story a few months back. There was this woman who went to the, uh, to the doctor's office with her husband. And after his checkup, the doctor asked the wife to come in. He had a few instructions that he wanted to give just to her. So they met alone and she uh, looked at her and said, uh, your, your husband is suffering from a pretty severe stress disorder. Um, 
And if you don't follow my instructions pretty carefully, he's probably not going to make it. So every morning I need you to fix him a a really um, healthy breakfast. And I just need you to be pleasant all the time. Fix him a really nice, healthy lunch. Make sure dinner is nutritious and delicious. Don't don't burden your husband with a whole lot of chores. Uh, Don't discuss your problems uh, with him. That's only going to make things worse. Uh, don't nag him. And, and I'm going to tell you, if you'll do this for about 10 months to a year, I expect that your husband will fully recover. So on the way home, the husband asked his wife, so what did she say? And she looked at him and said, uh, she said, you're going to die. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So let me refocus here now and get a little bit, a little bit more serious again. Sometimes, sometimes the cross that we are asked to bear for others can seem a little overwhelming. Would you agree? Sometimes when I'm walking with my brothers and sisters in Christ, when I'm walking with a family member, when I'm walking with someone who is really, really struggling, sometimes that can be a pretty tough cross to bear. Um, But there are a couple of truths that I just want you to consider. I think can help me better minister to others while also growing deeper in my own faith. So the walls of others may be collapsing around me. There's some things that I can do. And it it impacts what happens when the walls of my life collapse. Truth one. I don't think we can follow the suffering servant without experiencing personal suffering. I don't think we can have true insight into what Jesus did for us and how much Jesus loves us until we we experience some, some suffering ourselves. We are promised suffering. You know that, right? We're promised suffering. Jot down this reference, 2 Timothy 3, 12. If you get a chance, read it later. We're commanded... To bear one another's burdens. You know that, right? Read Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, when you get a chance. The word suffer is from an old English word, and it means to bear or to carry. When we suffer one another, it's, it's like carrying an extra load. It's like helping alleviate part of the burden but but to do that I have to take part of that burden upon myself when we suffer one another we walk with we support we assist we carry one another's burden for a while so when our elders ask us to pray we don't shrug our shoulders When when an invitation is given to serve in ministry, we don't say, yeah, someone should really volunteer for that. When we're challenged, instead instead of bowing our backs, we roll up our sleeves. And we ask, what can I do in this opportunity to build bridges in Jesus' name? Another truth, Christian character is not formed by Christian comfort. I would go so far to say Christian comfort is an oxymoron. And you know what that is, right? Two words that don't go together. Uh, Jumbo shrimp, that's an oxymoron, right? Two words that don't go together. Uh, Pretty ugly, you've heard somebody say that? Oh, that's pretty ugly. Rap music, you know, those two words just don't go, just don't go together. Okay. Jesus, Jesus does say in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all of you who labor, and I will give you rest. But he doesn't say, come to me, all of you who are taking it easy, and I will make it even easier. He doesn't say that. The rest that Jesus promises is for laborers. Did you know that sitting still is not a cure for atrophy? Did you know that? 
Didn't Jesus teach, though, Greg? Didn't, didn't he teach, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted? Yes, he taught that. But here's the deal. We don't mourn that which we keep. Mourning comes after loss. And when we live into our faith, losses are going to come. Now, we can play it safe. We can do that. But I, I believe true followers of Jesus Christ don't know the meaning of that term. Do you remember the verse that we read earlier from Nehemiah 3 and verse 5? The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles wouldn't put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. In the Hebrew text, it literally says, but the nobles would not put their necks to the work. In our modern vernacular, we would say it like this, the nobles wouldn't lay their necks on the line. Nobles have a tendency to get accustomed to comfort. That's how it happened then. The same thing can happen now. And sometimes our desire for comfort can keep us from dealing with our own pain, but also keep us from entering the pain of others. But that's not how God designed the church. As much as we are able... Entering the pain of others is one of the best ways to enter our own. I love this quote by Dr. Carl Menninger. He writes, love cures. And he's talking specifically about the love of God. The love of God cures. It cures those who give it. And it cures those who receive it. But we also know there's a qualifier. Scott McKnight writes, but love must be worked at because those with whom we live in our communities are not, unfortunately, innately lovable. You may have seen this meme in various forms. I love everybody. Some I love to be around, some I love to avoid, and others I love to punch in the face, right? <laughs> Maybe you've seen that before. But I think all of us can agree this is not what God's got in mind. Generally... When things don't go our way as Christians, generally, we often run from each other. When things don't go our way, we run from each other. What if we ran to each other instead? What if we would stop judging others and, and use those same energies to serve others? Why is it important that we process these questions? Because I fear that if we don't, we're just going to keep running around in circles. Same song, 47th verse. But it doesn't have to be that way. The good news is that Jesus Christ keeps us on firm footing. I never judge you based on what you can or can't do for me. I judge everything in my life because of what Jesus did for all of us. And if that's not good enough... Church, I got nothing. I got nothing else to give you. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 25, Paul writes, I have become the church's servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. What mystery is he talking about here? Well, the good news is he doesn't keep us in suspense very long. He defines this mystery by noting to the Lord's people, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And here's what's so awesome about this passage. Paul sets this entire section up, his suffering, their faithfulness, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is hope. Paul sets all of this up to point to one person. Jesus is the one we proclaim. Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may fully present everyone fully mature in Christ. Church. It is all about Jesus.
It's all about Jesus. Not so that we just get warm fuzzies Sunday to Sunday. That's not why it's all about Jesus. Not just so that we live a, a sanitized life that's free from heartache and free from pain. Not so that we avoid suffering, but so that we remain humble enough so that if the walls of my life collapse, I remember I follow a carpenter. I remember he is chief cornerstone. He is firm foundation. He is immovable. He is unshakable. He is unconquerable. And he will not and he cannot be overcome. And because of that, no matter what, neither will we. In the past eight months, I visited with two disciples of Jesus. Both were diagnosed with terminal cancer. Both were believers. Both looked me in the eye just weeks before their death and said, I'm good. I'm good. Because I know where I'm going. So a little while ago, I asked you, what do I do? What do I do when the walls of my life collapse? And if they haven't, they will. We're all going to be in those seasons when life doesn't make sense, when we're just challenged, when we're kind of beaten to death by the winds and the waves of the world. I mean, it's going to happen to all of us. But what do I do as a follower of Jesus Christ, as someone who has been set apart, as someone who is consecrated by the blood of Christ? What do I do? Well, I want to focus on an I, and then I want to focus on a we. And then we'll look at part two of this, this lesson next Sunday. I encourage you to remind yourself daily that in Christ you are consecrated. You are set apart. So that when the temptation comes, if you believe in, with all of your heart that you are holy because of what Christ Jesus has done in you through the power of his resurrection, it is so much easier to say, no thanks. No, that's not for me. I'm set apart. Set apart for a unique purpose by Jesus. Remember, you are restored, and remind yourself of that. I've been restored. The person I was is not the person I am. Not because of what I'm doing, but because of what Christ has done through the power of his blood, through the power of his resurrection. And remind yourself, and I think this is so important, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I also want to encourage us collectively as the body of Christ to remember that we are next to one another. We don't, we don't get to distance. We don't, we don't get to, to, to be Burger King church, you know? Have it your way. That's not what it's about. We're in this together, one another. And when we disagree, we don't divide. When we disagree, we dialogue. We pray together. We go into the Word together. We reason together. We try to discern together. And if we get to that place where we can't see eye to eye, well, then we make a decision. We don't make a decision and then not learn anything. It doesn't do anybody any good. Be in this together. Stay committed. Rebuild the walls. So many in this community and around, just within pitching distance of this building, so many people who need Jesus. How can we model reconciliation to them if we can't experience reconciliation in Christ ourselves? The love of God cures us. The love of God cures others. Man, that's a refrain worth repeating. And finally, Jesus is the one that we proclaim. I hope this study in, our, in the book of Nehemiah has, has blessed you this morning. I, I hope and pray that these, these lessons will not just be an abstract that we've learned about somebody else, but that we'll own them in our hearts and that as the body of Christ, we will boldly move forward knowing who we are and whose we are. Next Sunday, I'll look at part two of this with you. Uh, we're going to share a song together right now. This is a time if you have a prayer request that there will be some shepherds down uh, front to, to process that prayer request with you. If you want to be baptized this morning and have your sins washed away, what a great celebration that would be as we prepare to, uh, to leave this place here in just a bit. Um, if you don't want to come down front, if you're nervous about making a trip down and, and talking to the elders down here at the front, just talk to the person right beside you. Uh, we're all high priests in this place. <laughs> and so uh, someone can pray with you right in your pew. 
uh, as, we're, as we're singing this song together and encourage you and schedule a time to follow up this week. So whatever's on your heart, however you need to respond this morning, if you need to respond, then you can do that now while we stand together and sing.